Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, April 6th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not investment advice. I am not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you personalized individual investment advice. Everything that is presented is for informational and entertainment purposes only. <clears throat> okay, let's go ahead and get started. A little bit late this week, I was traveling, uh, but as you know, we always make the effort to get the video out regardless. So first thing I want to talk about is uh, Global PMI, that's purchaser Purchasing Managers Index. Um, it's a way to track the you know, country economies, manufacturing services, uh, S&P uh, puts it out. Uh, you can go to their website and uh, they have various, they drill down to various countries or sectors, what have you. But basically, uh, I just want to show this headline. Uh, the global PMIs are above 50 now. We've been talking about that for a while. Uh, the latest ones came out last week for March. And it says growth of global economic activity strengthens in March. Why do we care about this? Well, uh, as the PMI strengthen, uh, especially around manufacturing um, or basically economic activity in general, when it's growing, that requires more energy and raw material inputs. And so uh, we're seeing that starting to happen, right, with these price rises. You know, you have crude oils up about 10 bucks a barrel over the last several weeks. Um, you know, copper now is trading above $4 a pound. Uh, what, what, whatever you look at is basically starting to uh, get some demand under it and prices are starting to rise. So I think this is directly attributable to obviously increased economic activity economic activity that we anticipated uh, would start responding to the increase in central bank actions that have been happening around the world since uh, basically last summer. So again, as the world continues to, uh, central banks around the world continue to cut rates as liquidity increases, ec economic activity should be stimulated and we should see uh, demand for metals and energy go up. Uh, obviously, I think that that's what one of the main reasons why you're seeing gold and Bitcoin, some of these other uh, sectors advance is in anticipation of the Federal Reserve in the US and the ECB eventually uh, being laggards, but eventually coming to the rate cutting party. Or as I pointed out last week's video, as Greg Weldon uh, coined it, Money Fest 2024. So that's what we're, we're looking at. Uh, here's another slide that kind of talks about, uh, and I'll get into it more in the weekly email that I send out. You know, I send out a free email weekly uh, that gets a little bit more in depth or actually has links to a lot of these articles and has some further commentary, but uh, I'll have uh, more to say about what's going on with these PMIs and some more analysis. But basically here are the key findings is global composite PMI output index at 52.3. Obviously anything above 50 indicates expansion. Uh, new business intakes rise at faster rate. Business optimism hits nine month high. In that nine months, if you go back, that's basically when we saw as I pointed out, either last week or the week before, when we saw the tipping point of more central banks uh, entering rate cutting cycles than were raising rates. So, uh, again, trying to, you know, that's a way of crude looking at liquidity, but obviously, as rates come down and more money enters the system, uh, typically what that's what we do see is stimulative uh, econ economies are stimulated. So, uh, that's positive for the constituents of the actionable intelligence alert portfolio. Now, the other thing I would point out is, uh, in the oil market, um, we don't know yet as a recording of this video, at least 
you know, the Israelis hit the Iranian embassy in Damascus and the Iranians have vowed to retaliate. So I don't know if we're going to see an escalation in the Middle East, how much of the oil price rise is anticipating, you know, possible uh, expansion of the Mideast war. Regardless, um, uh, oil prices, energy prices were already rallying. So uh, that could be an additional catalyst. So regardless, um, a lot, I think, a lot of the stocks in the portfolio have been doing very well recently uh, just because they are focused on these areas, i.e. commodities and resources. So one of the reasons why I think that um, the United States Federal Reserve is going to cut rates regardless of what the inflation rate is, is because we have this situation developing. This is a Bank of America global research chart. And this is U.S. interest rate payment scenarios, U.S. interest rate payments in billions and rate projections. So basically, as we've been discussing in the past, you know, since the rate raising cycle that the Fed began here to ostensibly combat inflation, uh, we've seen interest payments on the debt skyrocket. This is the dark blue line. And so we're here, you know, and, and the projections are um, if there's no rate cuts, then by the end of the year, we could be at one at annual interest run rate on the federal debt of 1.6 trillion. Um, and here's the projection in yellow or orange, if you will, of assuming 1.5% Fed rate cuts, which is what's being anticipated by the market. So regardless, the deficit continues to or the interest on the debt continues to climb. Um, and we're seeing, we've talked about this for a long time. And I think this is another reason why we're seeing, you know, gold move higher. We're getting into this situation, I think, where the fiscal uh, condition of the United States is slowly but surely getting more and more negative and more and more people are waking up to the fact that both parties are spendthrifts. There's no constituency for cutting spending. Um, and then all the things that we've talked about many, many times before and that others have talked about, the entitlement issue, depending on how you want to look at 100 to $200 trillion in unfunded Social Security and Medicare liabilities, uh, looking at the fact that uh, you're running fiscal deficits now of five to six percent of GDP. You're increasing the debt by a trillion dollars every hundred days. Uh, this is going to be a problem at some point. And so I think people are starting to wake up to that fact and understand, look, if there's if there's not going to be any cutting of spending, if we're not going to get this under control, then it's going to possibly spiral out of control. We brought up uh, last in the last month's actionable intelligence alert newsletter, I did an analysis of the Congressional Budget Office's uh, forecasts, and they're forecasting $50 trillion in debt by 2033. We're going to hit that well before then, in my view. And that's assuming no recessions and you know the things that they assume. And they assumed a interest rate uh, across all of the government's debt of like 2.1%. So that's the assumptions that are being made are, I think, are going to understate what the real problem is. So even if they begin cutting rates, you're, you know, even if they only cut rates one point, you know, do three rate cuts this year of 50 basis points each, you still increase the debt, uh, the interest on the debt. And if you do nothing, then, it, you know, it just continues to go parabolic. And so I think that as the year <clears throat> goes along, they're going to be in a situation, they being the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, where you're going to see the narrative shift away from this 2% and, you know, inflation target to a higher one and it'll be fine. And I think eventually you're going to end up with yield curve control, which we've talked about all these things in the past. So I think going forward, you know, uh, you're going to be looking at a scenario of more um, how a lot of these emerging markets uh, swing inflation and, and things like that. So uh, I think we may have passed 
the event horizon on some of this stuff. The window of opportunity to deal with a lot of these issues has passed. And like I said, I don't really see any leadership in Washington, D.C. that's talking about getting things under control. Um, you know, it's uh, you could go for hours talking about it. But this is why I think that all leads, all roads lead to inflation. It's not just the U.S., it's the entire world, right? Uh, most of the developed world is tremendously in debt, has obligations that it cannot pay. And so I think that barring some type of revival or renaissance in thinking around physical responsibility, you're going to see the politicians do what take the easy way out, which is to uh, print money. I was listening to a podcast and somebody said they were in a room talking to a congressman, listening to some people talk to a congressman. I mean, these people don't have a clue. They're like bringing up all these things that we're talking about. And the person was like, okay, well, what's the tenure? And somebody was like 3%. Um, at, this was at the time of the conversation. The guy was like, so what's the problem? Well, it isn't a problem if you're on a two-year election cycle. It'll be somebody else's problem. You just, if it gets too ugly, you bail out with your millions and somebody else's problem. So this is really uh, going to come to a head at some point. It's one of those things that it doesn't matter until it matters. We've talked about all these things many, many times if you're a longer-term viewer. Regardless, I think this is why hard assets uh, must be a focal point of one's portfolio going forward. You know, if you got somebody elected in a new Congress and they said, we're going to tighten our belts, we're going to do this, we're going to reform all these entitlements, then I think you could uh, be looking at, you know, gold going down and, and resources going down. But I, I just don't see that currently. And then, you know, you throw on top of it that we're in the fourth turning and that we're literally in World War Three, even though most people don't realize uh, wars are necessarily inflationary. So... Yeah, we just got all roads lead to inflation, in my view. That's the only way out for these politicians. So again, uh, just to bring up the fact, to set the stage here, you see that the three-month moving average, or the PMI has broken above the three-month three, three moving average, so we're now accelerating globally. We just talked about that earlier. The reason that's important is because the logical outcome is as commodity prices and stocks have tracked the global PMI, um, medium monthly returns six months after the PMI crossed above the three month average. You see that crude oil's up, the S and P metals and mining it up, copper's up, uh, and obviously we've we've already crossed. We've had the PMI cross the three month average, so this is what we're seeing. Everything's playing out just as anticipated in the past, where we see that. Uh, Metals and mining and crude oil are advancing, as you would expect, is the logical outcome of increased economic activity, uh, drawing in the need for more energy and raw materials. Uh, just wanted to show this. This is the uh, rate cut, rate cutting expectations going forward. Um, you know, there's a lot of chatter right now because nothing's set in stone right um there's this situation that the fed is in where it's trying to maintain some semblance of independence at least to the market but with the federal government just going crazy with the spending um you know the rise in rates has not had the necessary breaks on the economy and to pull back uh, the CPI or the inflation rate. So we're in this tug of war, it, but ultimately like I have said before, I feel like the federal reserve is a political entity uh, and it will, uh, they eventually will cut rates and uh, they won't be, you know, when they cut rates, as you can see, it's usually after a crisis, right? They raise rates, they, they plateau for some period of time, then some crisis happens. Then there's like this massive cut the typical rate cutting cycle is like five basis points or 500 basis points, which is five percentage points. And so it's not just like this slow thing. Something's going to break. Something bad's going to happen. It's going to necessitate the Fed to come in big, which they've normally done going all the way back to the length of this start. You know, this is the tech wreck. This is the housing bubble. This is COVID. You see what happens. 
you know, they keep rates up here um, for some period of time, something breaks, and then they come in with a massive uh, rate cuts and QE and everything else. And it, it, I don't think this scenario, I guess it's the point of the chart, it's not going to be this slow slide. It'll be something breaks, which who knows what it'll be. And bang, uh, they'll just come in and massively cut rates over like one, you know, very quickly. And, uh, you know, I think in that kind of scenario, that's what I think gold and all these things are, are sniffing out. Obviously, I think that the gold market is really being driven by central banks, particularly China buying gold, as we've talked about before. But I think that uh, I think that's going to change drastically once the uh, it becomes obvious what's going to happen and uh, this uh, reliquification cycle that's going on, a new liquidity cycle, if you will, uh, around the world. So more positive news out of the emerging markets. Here's India stating that they're going to increase their nuclear capacity 12 times by 2047. And we keep seeing articles like this, right, as we have these countries building out nuclear reactors, realizing that um, this is the future and they just keep increasing their plans uh, as time goes by. And so it says here, India aims to produce 100,000 megawatts of nuclear power by 2047, a massive increase from the current production of over 8,000 megawatts, the Atomic Energy Commission chairman said on Wednesday. The report released on Wednesday stated that if India planned to phase down coal usage in the next three decades, it would need to build adequate infrastructure for alternative sources such as nuclear power, in addition to flexible grid infrastructure and storage to support the integration of renewable energy. So again, this is not just going to be common in China and India. More and more countries are going to realize or have realized. That's why we've seen the zeitgeist change over the last 18 months or so, year to 18 months, two years. Uh, to being positive on nuclear power and understanding that it is the future. Uh, so again, if you wanna look at the demand side of uranium, it's just improving constantly. And yet the supply, you know, we're seeing brownfield projects come online. What I mean by brownfield projects are projects that had been operating previously and had been shut down and put on care and maintenance for some period. They've, they're starting to be turned back on now but that will be insufficient to meet the uh, supply or the demands uh, of all of this increased usage that's coming up, coming online over the next 20 years. Again, there's no like shortage of uranium in the Earth's crust. What there is is a shortage of capital, uh, right currently at least, or incentives for people to invest the billions of dollars that's needed to access and produce the required uranium. And again, that time period, that long time period that it takes is the individual retail investors opportunity. You have the ability to be patient and wait uh, as that gap gets closed, okay? And so that's where your opportunity is. Again, we are in a long-term uranium bull market uh, that will continue uh, for many years at least as long as there's not another Chernobyl or Fukushima. But uh, barring some something like that, I don't see anything derailing this. And so, again, I recommend folks uh, buy on dips and hold. Uh, some people, are, I guess, are choosing to trade around it. That's your prerogative. But I think that uh, this is on track, uh, this uranium bull market. Uh, copper, we talk, we've been talking about this for about a year uh, more intensively the last six months, I've, you know, gave out a publicly uh, about a month or two ago, a name that I own shares in. Uh, I don't expect to be a 10 bagger, but uh, Amerigo Resources, which is a company that processes the tailings from the Chilean uh, Cadelco mines in Chile and extracts the residual copper uh, out of those tailings. And so that's a tremendous business, basically a manufacturing business. They're just using water jets to create a slurry of these tailings and the tailings go through Amerigo's processing plant and they extract the copper and molybdenum uh, that's re still residing in those tailings and uh, 
they make a pretty good uh, margin here, especially when you see copper over four dollars a pound. Uh, tremendous amount of cash flow, and uh, they pay about a, I think currently just based on the current price of the stock and the current dividends about eight or nine percent yield. And uh, if I not mistaken, I do believe they are buying back stock. So there's different ways to take advantage of this. Um, uh, again, you don't necessarily have to just buy the, some junior exploration company. There are, as the price goes up, um, you know, a company like Tech in Canada is a, is a very nice company. They really divest themselves of a lot of their coal assets and are focusing on their copper projects. Um, those are coming online. So Again, supply issues in copper that were not anticipated to hit this year with the closing of the mine uh, in in Panama and then other companies like uh, Anglo-American not meeting their production uh, forecasts. So this is bringing forward a little bit, about a year or so, the uh, what we were already looking at, which was a supply deficit in copper. So... With the PMIs advancing, with economic growth uh, now uh, intact and, and getting better around the world, we can anticipate more copper demand. Again, we're in another scenario where uh, I showed maybe a week or two ago, you know, no really big time discoveries in the last several years. So you're so that you're left with the question again: Where does the copper come from? And so you're in a situation again where higher prices are going to come along and incentivize more exploration and more development. But again, these, this takes years. Talking about crude inventories here, uh, here's a chart. Um, here's the current uh, global observable oil inventories onshore and oil on water, just as a comparison. Um, here is... I'll just focus on this year. You know, I find this interesting that uh, as we enter the summer driving season now coming up, uh, we have oil Brent's up above 90, WTI's at 87. Can we make a run to 100? I don't know. But again, we don't really need that for a lot of the companies in our portfolio. We have uh, several companies that uh, have projects that are cash flowing tremendously. They were cash flowing tremendously at $80 Brent. Or seventy-five dollar Brent, and now this increased pricing. Uh, again, companies have paid down a lot of debt. One of the companies we have has paid down debt sufficiently that they are devoting one hundred percent of cash flow to uh, shareholder returns, i.e., dividends and share buybacks. And I don't think people understand. The amount of companies would be a good exercise for like a research analyst or somebody with a Bloomberg is to figure out like all the companies that are in oil companies that are engaged in share buybacks and how that universe of shares is shrinking and, and at what rate uh, the supply of shares is being, you know, hoovered up by these uh, oil companies as they uh, are reticent to invest their cash flows in new production or reserves, but uh, have been on the the new thought which was shareholder returns and returning capital to shareholders so again looking forward that should continue for some period of time again that's going to again lead to the lack of investment lead to higher prices again i i've said that i think we're heading for a supply crunch in in crude oil over the next year two years something like that can't pin it down exactly but the the just tremendous amount of underinvestment that has taken place is going to manifest, I believe, in higher prices. Wanted to show this, uh, you know, <laughs> the plan didn't really work. You know, they were going to sanction Russia and Russia was going to suffer economically. And then the regime in Moscow was going to be overthrown. And you know the story. And what we've seen instead is Russia's oil revenues doubled year over year. So this is this year's and March oil and gas revenue in Russia. And last year um, says Russia's oil gas proceeds spike as the nation has been adapting to sanctions. And so, you know, you just can't remove, you know, them being either the first or, or second in the top three of oil exporters. You're just not going to shut it down or oil prices are going to go through the roof. And so, 
it, it was never going to work in my opinion. So again, you know, don't be surprised. I mean, the Russians did say that they were going to cut back production a little bit, uh, especially because of the fact that these refineries had been hit uh, by the Ukrainians. And so there's nowhere for the crew to go. So uh, maybe that's basically the Ukrainians are going to help Mr. Biden not be elected if they keep doing that, uh, because if there's nowhere for the crew to go, the Russians would have to slowly but surely lower production. Uh, if they don't have the ability to refine it as typical or export it, you know, prices would go higher. Obviously, crude oil is fungible, right? So um, I do think that that's going to be a big problem for the Biden administration this summer. If gasoline gets over $4 a gallon, which I anticipate likely could happen uh, going into the election. So it'll be. I think there's a lot of potential fireworks in the crude oil market, again, mentioning we don't know what Iran's going to do after its embassy in Damascus was hit by the Israelis the other day. Uh, you know, they did vow to retaliate. If they retaliate, what does that mean? They've already told the U.S. to stay out of this uh, when they do retaliate. So, you know, if we get into a scenario where you have a wider Middle Eastern war or the the measured responses are not measured and then we have this escalation tit for tat and it blows up into a full mid-east war or to the need where maybe the iranians feel they need to you know challenge the export of oil from the middle east for some period of time to af affect some political pressure onto israel what have you you can come with all kinds of scenarios you know you could very easily be over a hundred dollars a barrel very quickly so we'll see what happens but, you know, Russia has this too. They could, you know, I think that the Russians would rather have a Trump administration to deal with, especially when Mr. Trump has said that he'll end the Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine war the second day, the first day he's in office. So um, all you have to do is dial down oil production a little bit, use the excuses of these refineries being hit or what have you. And next thing you know, gas is gasoline in the U.S. is four, four fifty a gallon. And Mr. Biden's already tenuous reelection hopes would uh, go up in flames. So I think there's a lot of potential. What I'm getting at is there's a lot of potential political machina machinations uh, in the background that people probably need to be paying attention to. Regardless, it's still a bullish environment for crude oil and energy in general uh, for this year, especially, like I said, with global PMIs now above 50 and increasing. I thought this was interesting charts from Bloomberg. It says Q1 EV deliveries down sharply for Tesla and BYD. BYD be, be, being the large Chinese EV builder, build your own, build your dreams. And you see the drop off uh, in Q1 2024 sales for Tesla and BYD. So is this a temporary phenomenon? Is this, hey, everybody that wants an EV has one now. Uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, again, until the battery technology improves, until the price comes down to be more reasonable, uh, I don't think that you're going to get the uptake with the masses that's needed to continue the growth that we've had in the past. So something to watch. Um, again, obviously things, mass production and technology you know, does make things cheaper, but you know it's not Batteries are a chemistry situation, not necessarily a microchip Moore's law situation where they just, you know, increase in capacity 100% and go down in price by 50% every, you know, year to 18 months. It's not the same phenomenon. So we'll have to see what happens. But again, um, I think that at least the hype is off this. Like I said, I think we've had peak ESG was probably a year ago. Um peak DEI now. People are, uh, I read an article recently on that. I think a lot of these uh, things were fashionable at one time. And then uh, again, I think the left just goes too far in pushing these things. And then people just, uh, you know, one donut's good, but a dozen donuts makes you sick to your stomach. So it's kind of the same thing, I think. Uh, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, but uh, actually, you know, the whole battery metals bull market situation kind of went up in flames, right? The lithium, lithium's crashed, nickel's crashed. I think copper still has 
because it has so many other uses that are tied to uh, the electrification of the world and, you know, further uh, as, as people's GDP goes up, they require more copper. There's a pretty good scatter chart that Gorin and Rosenzweig showed as per capita GDP goes up. It shows the relationship with the amount of copper that's per capita copper usage in a country. So as per capita GDP goes up, per capita copper usage has to go up to support that. So I think regardless of what happens with EVs and green metals, as you were, uh, as they were called, you know, there was a lot of hype around lithium, nickel, and copper. But as this is slowed down, I think uh, the copper will still, I think, has, has pretty good catalysts regardless of what happens with EVs. So I wanted to show this. I don't know if this was a goof or if somebody was just playing around, but this was on x and this is a uh, supposedly up in canada at a costco it was 12 drumsticks uh buffalo chicken drumsticks uh at costco a dozen 202 canadian dollars i don't know if that's true or not i don't know if that's accurate uh, people that are up in canada can let us know but i mean I know there's a lot of people that are unhappy in Canada right now with the cost of living and the way the Trudeau government has mismanaged the economy. And uh, I think that they're very low in the polls. But if something like this is going on, I mean, you can't even survive. I mean, I think a dozen drumsticks over at uh, the store over here is like six bucks or something. You know, it's not that much. I don't know how you get to 202 Canadian dollars. Is the Canadian dollar that weak? I, I, I guess I'm not. You know, I, I have seen quite a few videos or, or TikTok videos or YouTube videos, people complaining about the prices in Canada, but I didn't realize it was this this onerous, if, if this is true or not. I, I don't know. And they don't, with the finger next to them, these are not like very big drumsticks either. It doesn't look like, I don't know. It's, uh, that's, that's crazy if that's, if that's, tr if this is true. All right. Well, that's it for this week. I want to point out one thing. Um, like I said, I was traveling, so this is a little bit shit this week. Consider subscribing to the free emails. You can go down into the show notes. I, I send out a free email usually Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, depending on how long it takes me to put together. It usually has, I expand in there, I uh, link to videos, podcasts, articles that I found interesting during the week. Uh, I usually have additional commentary about a lot of these issues. You know, we only have a certain amount of time to discuss in the slides each week. I get into a little bit more depth and that gives you a more flavor of what my thinking is, is and uh, especially kind of the themes that we're looking at in the paid version of the actionable intelligence alert newsletter. The actionable intelligence alert newsletter, the paid newsletter is where we actually have the, the actual investment vehicles uh, and the way we're taking advantage of a lot of these themes that we discuss. Uh, so those are available. Also, you know, if you wanna help out the channel, we also have, uh, you know, like like these videos, forward them, comment. Uh, it, it helps us out with the algorithm. Uh, we also have a Patreon uh, that you can sign up. If you sign up for the Patreon, I will send you the most recent edition, the write-up for the most recent edition of the AIA newsletter uh, that's a one-shot deal. I think some people are confused. They think, well, if I subscribe to the Patreon and support uh, you, John, that every month or whenever you get a new pick, you'll send it. No, it's a one-shot deal uh, to kind of give you a sense of uh, of what kind of stocks that we're talking about in the portfolio and, and what, the, what the paid newsletter, give you a flavor of that. Uh, but again, that's a one-shot deal. So those are the various ways you can support the channel. And uh, we definitely... Uh, so, you know, uh, like like the support. Uh, we're on Substack. That's where the news, free newsletter and the paid newsletter are. All links for all this is in the show notes. And if you're interested, check that out down below. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. A little short but sweet. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thank you.